for the fifth um, uh, ISCH webinar of 2021. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Noel Pollock. I'm a, a sport and exercise medicine consultant at the ISCH. Uh, ISCH is a collaboration between UCL, uh, the NHS, uh, the EIS, the British Olympic Association and the HCA at uh, Tottenham Court Road in London. Uh, and it provides uh, uh, diagnostics and management for elite amateur sports people. Uh, more information on the ISEH and to view recordings of all the previous webinars and this evening's uh, webinar, uh, uh, all available on our website. Uh, but tonight, our focus is on the hand and wrist, and I'm delighted to be joined by our expert uh, expert panel. Uh, we'll have three 15-minute uh, presentations followed by a Q&A. Uh, if, you, if you do have questions for uh, any of the presenters, please put them in the chat box. Um, Ideally, uh, as we go through the presentations, rather than all at the end, um, and then we'll revisit them all with questions for all the uh, all the presenters at the end. Um, uh, please feel free, obviously, to share on uh, social media um, uh, unless, unless uh, requested otherwise. And um, the hashtag is ISEH Sports Med. Um, so to move on to our first uh, speaker, our first speaker is Mr. Alistair Hunter. Uh, Alistair is a consultant, uh, orthopedic hand, wrist and uh, elbow surgeon at the ICH uh, with an NHS practice at UCL and we'll speak this evening on ulnar sided wrist pain. Uh, Alistair. Good. Uh, thank you, Noel, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining on this uh, Monday evening. Uh, I, uh, I'm going to talk to you about the ulnar-sided wrist pain in sports. Um, I work at University College London Hospitals in my NHS practice. Uh, I'm also based at the ISCH and the Princess Grace in my private practice. Um, and I see a lot of these injuries coming in. Uh, and they're often quite difficult to unpick. The, the ulnar side of the wrist is a, is a black box, uh, and there are a number of different diagnoses which it can be difficult to uh, tease out. So these injuries can happen for a number of reasons in sport, often uh, ball sports, uh, often collisions, either boxing or falling off bikes or collisions with uh, other players, uh, or with twisting injuries. So things like tennis, gymnastics, racket sports, uh, etc. So uh, what we'll do is we'll start off with a case study. Um, we'll, we'll then talk through the uh, examination, uh, investigations uh, and the treatment of this uh, particular case. And then we'll talk through some other important differential diagnoses. Uh, uh, we'll have time at the end for, for, uh, for questions. Uh, so, so feel free to put them in the in the chat box. Uh, so this is quite a useful slide. Um, Quite busy, but we'll orientate you. At the top there, we've got uh, dorsal. At the bottom, we've got volar. On the left, radial, and on the right, ulna. So we're focusing mainly on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, and you know, looking at the most common diagnoses uh, from the bottom right here, we're looking at TFCC, so triangular fibro cartilage tear, ulnar carpal abutment, uh, FCU tendonitis, um, has a triquetral arthritis, and then on the more dorsal side. The classic ones are the uh, ECU tendonitis or instability, uh, DIUJ pathology, just a radial joint, or lunatriquetral instability. And so when we're taking the history, when we're examining and investigating, we need to have these diagnoses to mind so that we can narrow down our focus. Clearly, there's also potential for fractures to any of the bones on the, on the side of the wrist, as well as these other diagnoses. So this slide uh, helped me a lot in understanding the anatomy of the ulnar side of the wrist, uh, and I'll take you through this. Uh, first of all, um, in the red, we can see the radius and ulna, uh, and then the ulna styloid uh, is also uh, shown. Uh, and there can be subtle ulna styloid fractures causing, causing pain in this region. Uh, in the green is the triangular fibrocartilaginous complex, so TFCC. And that's made up of the dorsal radio on the ligament, so between the uh, ulna and the radius, the volar radio on the ligament, and then the central disc in this area around here. And if you look at the box on the bottom right, that's sorry, the bottom left, that's it shown a bit more clearly. Um, so this can be torn, and this is an important stabiliser of the wrist, which we'll come to in a moment. Uh, in blue, uh, there are the important volar 
ulnar lunates and ulnar triquetral ligaments, uh, stabilizers of the DIEJ again. And there's the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon, which you can see over the dorsal aspect of the wrist, coming around the groove for the ECU around the ulnar styloid. And it has its own sheath, its own subsheath, which in itself can be torn. So those are the important structures which we may come back to. When we're examining uh, the normal processes, look, feel, move, special tests and imaging, I would advise uh, if, if you're doing examinations here in the hand and wrist is look, move, then feel. Because by asking the patient to move just simple exercise like this or, or flexion like this, we can get a very quick idea about the extent of any injury and the location. I always ask the patient to point with one finger where the site of the symptoms are, because the structures I've just talked about in the last couple of minutes are all very superficial. The advantage of the wrist is that we can point to these structures and we can examine them very specifically. So on this picture, you can see there are some of the structures outlined, uh, similar to the diagram I've just shown you. Uh, and if we palpate each of these structures in turn very carefully, we can be more specific in narrowing down our differential diagnosis. Now, I examine with the wrist in this position, so tends to be with the elbow flexed, elbow on the table, uh, and then you're looking directly at the ulnar side of the wrist and you can examine it more easily. So we talked about palpation. Um, we'll go on to special tests in a moment. So in this uh, uh, patient, um, they had a twisting injury uh, playing tennis. And the classic injury here is a TFCC tear. So the continuation of the radius cartilage uh, is, is what the TFCC is all about. It's a smooth structure. And the, in the picture on the right here, we can see that there's almost no, almost no discontinuity between the cartilage down here in the lunate fossa of the distal radius and then the TFCC. It's one smooth bed. It transmits the force and absorbs load, a little bit like the meniscus in the knee, uh, which is a, a similar kind of structure. And it connects the radius and ulna and supports the DIUJ, the distal radial ulnar joint. Uh, these are some further images just to help us understand it a little bit more. Here's a uh, had a very specimen where we can see the in, in cross section the radius and the ulna. And here's this triangular fibre cartilage. OK, you can see why it's triangular in the cross section. Um, and when we look at this schematic diagram, we can see there are two insertions. One is on the ulnar styloid. That's the superficial insertion. And the deep limb is called the fovea. So it inserts deep into the uh, pocket around the ulnar head. You can see it down here. Um, now, if we have just a peripheral superficial tear, um, patients may have pain, but they're unlikely to have instability of the distal radial ulnar joint. If they have tears of both the peripheral section and also the feveal insertion, then very commonly they have pain plus instability at the distal radial ulnar joint. And so we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment, how to manage each. So examining for TFCC tears in particular, well, I often see these patients at least a couple of weeks after their injury um, patients often give it a moment or two, a few days or a few weeks to settle down and then realise it isn't getting better. Um, the swelling isn't usually particularly great and there's not usually much bruising. There's a pocket just over the ulnar aspect of the wrist. So on this picture here, uh, to the left is the dorsal aspect of the wrist, to the right is the palmar aspect. And we can see the ECU tendon in a hatch and the FCU tendon here. And between the two, and just beyond the ulnar head is this fovea, which um, is tender in patients with a TFCC tear. Um, they often have a positive ulnar grind test, so forced ulnar deviation of the wrist. Uh, they often have a click on supination and pronation in this ulnar deviated position. Um, and they may have instability of the DIUJ. So on the far right, we can see that if we clamp the radius and the carpus together with one hand, the left hand, and then move the ulna head dorsally and volally uh, against the radius, then if we compare it to the other side, we can find often there's instability. That takes quite a lot of practice. So if you are going to do that test, uh, practice it on normal patients, uh, and then you'll find out the abnormal sides. You always examine the other side to find the difference. So those are the main findings for TFCC tears. 
the key investigation is usually an MRI scan. Often we'll get a plain X-ray just to rule out an obvious fracture of any of the other bones. But beyond that, uh, an MRI scan can very clearly show the injury. You can see it here where there's that triangular black area, which is the fibre cartilage, and this clear white line which shows a tear. Um, in the past, we used to do arthrograms, so injection uh, into the wrist, then MRI scan. Um, but that's less commonly done now because the scans are, are really very good. The scans, however, are not perfect. And, and if you look at that slide, uh, if you look at the top row there, the sensitivity and specificity of MRI scans is in the low 80s, really. Uh, and so there are patients who are either diagnosed with a tear that, that don't have one or have a tear who are, are diagnosed with a false negative. Now, 3T scans, so higher resolution. Uh, we have a, a very good 3T scan at, at ICH, which I use uh, very commonly for these types of injuries. Uh, increases the sensitivity and specificity, but, but still it's not perfect. Uh, and so the gold standard really for confirming and investigating these is a wrist arthroscopy. So that's a keyhole procedure with small incisions in the back of the wrist, uh, where we can see with our own eyes the diagnosis. And I'll, I'll show you some uh, video in a moment. So for a patient with a uh, central TFCC tear uh, and a stable DIEJ, uh, I would say that uh, we should have non-operative treatment initially, uh, four weeks in a cast, anti-inflammatories, uh, and then four weeks of specific hand wrist physiotherapy, concentrating on strengthening and proprioceptive exercises. Um, if this doesn't work after four weeks, then an injection uh, under image guidance to the ulnar carpal joint around the TFCC can in around 60% of patients with just these central stable tears uh, can completely resolve the symptoms and allow a, a window period of freedom from pain that the patient can get moving. Uh, operatively, if after three or four months the symptoms are ongoing despite all these measures, then a wrist arthroscopy, uh, much like what you can see in the top right corner here, uh, showing the uh, tear, uh, and this can be debrided, this can be uh, leveled out so there's no catching edges to the tear uh, that would cause any symptoms. Uh, and there's a pretty fast return to sport. So return to light ball contact in about three or four weeks and unrestricted at four to five weeks. So can work very well and good good success rates there. Now for patients with a uh, peripheral uh, TFCC tear with an unstable DIUJ. This indicates that there's a lot more going on. We can see here the normal trampoline effect, the normal tight structure of the TFCC is very lax there. I'm able with the hook probe to push quite hard and, and you can see that this is not tight. Now underneath, I'm pulling up underneath the TFCC there and you can see the faveal tear has happened. So that, that's a patient where there's a faveal tear and is unstable DIEJ. So in this case, um, if both elements of the TFCC are torn, I would do a, a faveal repair. That means uh, sutures down through the fovea at the armor head. And this can be done either arthroscopically or open. I tend to do it open. Uh, and again, the results can be very good. Re-establishing the stability between the radius and the ulna, which is otherwise lost in these more significant injuries. So uh, just bring this to a close, I'll talk briefly about some other differential diagnoses. Uh, ECU tendon is another common uh, site of pathology, uh, particularly in racket sports uh, and golf. Uh, and here on the top right, you can see the uh, normal structures of the uh, ECU tendon. So uh, ulna head uh, just here, um, the ECU tendon overriding the uh, ulna styloid, and then a separate sheath for the ECU. And in the cross section here, here's the radius, here's the ulna on the left. And we can see here, there's the retinaculum of the wrist. One of the, and then here's the subsheath. And we can have a tear of the subsheath here, causing instability of the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon. Or we can see due to overuse, uh, repetitive activities, lots of sport playing, that the patients can get tendonitis, either acute or chronic. And so if it's tendonitis, it usually settles down with rest, splintage and hand therapy. But if not, then 
uh, an ultrasound guide and injection to that tendon sheath. Um, if there's instability, um, the more mild uh, instabilities can settle down with some stabilizing hand physiotherapy exercises, but otherwise you're into surgical stabilization. So next, uh, ulnar carpal abutment. Um, so this is where patients have pain, usually on uh, heavy loading of the wrist. Uh, again, tennis, gymnasts, these sorts of activities. Um, and it happens often due to something called an ulnar positive variant. So if the ulna is longer than the radius, whereas the radius is normally longer than the ulna, the head of the ulna, as you can see in the top right here, can start to impinge upon the lunate, the, the most proximal part of the lunate, cause pain, uh, cause edema, and ultimately can cause arthritis. So we often see TFCC tears in association with this. Uh, an MRI scan is a good investigation to confirm it. An injection can help confirm that this is the pain generator. Uh, and ultimately, uh, a surgical approach involving a ulnar shortening osteotomy. So in the bottom right, we can see that the proud ulnar head here, if we excise a few millimeters of bone, this can then be leveled out to bring them into ulnar neutral variants. Uh, and this is a good operation, reliable way of relieving that symptom. Another one not to miss is the hook of hamate fracture. Uh, this is often a delayed presentation, so patient presenting maybe weeks or months afterwards with a dull ache in the hypothenar eminence, so in the palm of the hand over the ulnar side. Um, can often happen due to uh, an injury when holding a golf club or a bat, uh, either directly hitting the ground uh, or a direct blow falling off the bicycle. Uh, the clinical suspicion is there when they still have pain beyond two weeks, when usually tenderness in this area should settle down. Uh, X-rays can sometimes show the diagnosis. Uh, in the top left here, we can see something going on with the hamate, but the CT scan or MRI scan really defines it very well. Here's a CT sagittal view. We can see that there's a clear fracture through the hook of the hamate, um, and this can be painful, and the pain often doesn't settle down uh, because the hook of hamate is an important stabilizing structure in the wrist. So in patients who are not elite athletes and only have minor symptoms, these can purely be observed. Uh, a splint can help sometimes settle it down, uh, and often it will heal by fibrous union. Um, but the hook of hamate fractures have a tendency not to heal and go on to a painful non-union. So if it's an elite athlete and they're symptomatic, you could consider either an end of uh, season or out of season procedure to excise the hook of the hamate because left uh, alone, and if it causes symptoms, we can see rupture of the flexor tendons or ulnar nerve dysfunction. So it's an important one to diagnose uh, and is easily treated and avoids complications further down the line. Last one is uh, ulnar nerve compression. Now, normally we talk about ulnar nerve compression at the elbow, uh, cubital tunnel syndrome, but repetitive loading of the ulnar nerve at the wrist at Guillaume's Canal is classic in prolonged cycling. Lots of people are into cycling at the moment and uh, long hours on the bike can cause tingling in the fingers, so the ulna one and a half fingers, or weakness in the hand. Uh, history and examination are crucial, so really getting down to understanding the pattern of nerve uh, deficit. Uh, but ultimately, a nerve conduction study can help confirm the site of any nerve lesion. And an MRI scan can rule out any other causes for compression of the ulnar nerve at the wrist, so sometimes a ganglion cyst from the piezotriquetral joint, uh, an ul ulnar artery thrombosis, uh, or an occult fracture that we haven't uh, identified, like the um, fractures we've just been talking about. So for these patients, either uh, avoidance of the heavy loading or wearing gloves or padding on the hand when cycling uh, can help, uh, or we're talking about surgical decompression of Guillaume's canal, uh, and that gives good results. Um, so overall, uh, I've given you a good idea of the uh, anatomy of the ulnar side of the wrist and the differential diagnosis. Careful examination is really important. Um, the TFCC and ECU tendon pathologies are common, uh, and those are the sort of go-to diagnoses. But we've got to rule out fractures and less common causes, which we identified both in the examples I gave, but also in the differential diagnoses earlier on. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to some questions at the end.
First, thank you very much, uh, Alistair. Uh, yes, if you do have questions for Alistair, please uh, put them in the chat box and, uh, and we'll come back to them at about 20 past seven. Uh, thanks, Alistair. Um, our next speaker is uh, uh, Professor Mike Loosemore. Um, Mike is a consultant in sport and exercise medicine at the ICH. Um, uh, Mike will be well known to uh, many of you in sports. He's, he's uh, travelled extensively. He's been at four Olympic Games and is chief medical officer for GB boxing and GB snow sports. Um, and this evening, uh, Mike is going to speak on hand injury in boxers. Uh, thanks, Mike. Okay. Thanks, Noel. Always good to start at the beginning, I find. Uh, well, thank you very much for asking me to speak. Uh, I am not a surgeon like uh, our uh, other two colleagues here. Uh, and I always try and treat hand injuries the, the best I can without going to surgery, uh, mainly through the strength and conditioning and physiotherapy. However, as you will see from this talk, uh, occasionally we do have to resort to going to the surgeons and I've used both the surgeons uh, here uh, regularly uh, with some excellent results. Uh, I've been asked to speak on hand injuries in boxing today uh, and unfortunately I only have 15 minutes. So what I've done is I've decided to talk about one specific hand injury in boxing which is uh, boxer's knuckle. Uh, what I'm going to do is just initially show you a video um, to give you an idea of the sort of punishment that hands take uh, in boxing. And um, just remember that these these boxers. This is a uh, the quarterfinal of the Olympic Games, and these boxers. Uh, are wearing 12 ounce gloves uh, and heads are very hard. But how about that for a right hand? Tremendous stuff and also the left up. Look at that for a punch. And let's let's face it, Ronald, it wasn't as if it was a lucky punch. He was winning this contest. He was beating this fella who was favoured to beat Joshua Boatze here. But Boatze has produced the performance of his career. Tremendous stuff. Power punching, good tactics. Let's bring in the coaches as well, Dave. <laughs> so, as you can see from that, uh, the, the hands can take quite a lot of punishment uh, during a boxing match. And the boxers should be boxing with uh, usually the second and third metacarpal. And these tend to be the areas where we get boxers' knuckle. Uh, the knuckles become painful, uh, often swollen, and have a sort of uh, a boggy feeling about them. Sometimes you can even get uh, visible movement of the extensor tendon over the knuckle as they make a fist. Uh, and in extreme cases, uh, the boxer can't actually straighten the finger because the uh, extensor tendon has completely subluxed. Uh, the, the first investigation we would do would be an MRI scan or an ultrasound scan, and um, good ultrasonographers can pick up uh, these injuries. So again, just a quick look at the anatomy of the knuckle. And the, the, probably the main thing to look at is the sagittal band. And the sagittal band supports the uh, extensor tendon as it runs over the knuckle. And if you think when you make a fist, the only thing under the skin protecting uh, the metacarpal phalangeal joint is the extensor tendon. So it is the extensor tendon that gives you the, the padding and the, the resistance uh, when you punch. 
So if you lose <clears throat> that protection of the extensor tendon uh, by uh, damage to the sagittal band, then you are basically punching on the joint itself and it can be extremely painful. So it's not really surprising that um, athletes will present with uh, a painful knuckle. And the bogginess also comes from the, the inflammation and sometimes leaking of uh, fluid from the joint. So, so it's, the, it's the tears usually occur along the sagittal band here. And as you can see, as the knuckle is made, this sagittal band tightens up. So that then gets tight and holds the extensor tendon on but it does make it vulnerable, particularly at this point, to tearing. And as you can see, if you have a, a shearing force, yeah. when you uh, hit yeah, across, the, across the uh, boxer, then you can tear the sagittal band. I think somebody needs to go on mute. So this is a, a 3T arthrogram of a boxer's knuckle and you can see the disruption of the sagittal, sagittal band here and again this is another uh, disruption of a, a boxer's knuckle this unfortunately is uh, on the fifth which they shouldn't really have injured because they're not supposed to hit through the fifth but they did and you can see the tear quite clearly here, and you can see the 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 dye leaking around the outside yeah. of the central band because of the damage. And this is a, this is a three T yeah. And occasionally, when the sagittal band is quite badly disrupted, you start to get instability of that extensor tendon. And you can see, I think quite clearly in the video, this boxer's party trick, which is flicking his extensor tendon across his knuckle as he makes a fist. And the MG road tenapono. So, we treat this well, we want to avoid operating on them if we possibly can. Uh, so, initially, rest or relative rest, ice and compression, and uh, manual therapy, usually to restore full joint movement. We really need about 90 degrees of flexion of the carpo metacarpal of the. Uh, pharyngeal joint uh, to be able to punch properly uh, because otherwise you can't make a fist and if you cannot get that to 90 degrees you can imagine punching on a sore knuckle with the, the fist not completely made is extremely painful uh, for hand rehab we use uh, all sorts of different things the, the thera ones uh, which you can see in the illustration here on the right, uh, putty which the boxers can squeeze, uh, bands that you can put around the hand to open it, and spiky balls to help um, with um, gating the pain. Uh, we can use we use graded return to impact, uh, which can be on the hand itself, which is increasing the padding offloading the knuckle area with increasing padding in certain points. But it can also be using different types of bag to hit when you return. Uh, so we often use, uh, instead of using a heavy bag, we'll use uh, mm -hmm. a water bag initially, which offloads the area which is much softer to hit. Uh, we do use corticosteroid injections, um, but this tends to be when there isn't an obvious tear and there is just um, synovitis within the knuckle and, and the knuckle is uh, painful and swollen, but without a tear. And this is some uh, various exercises that the, the boxers do. Uh, if I'm using the, the, the Thera wand, 
intrinsic muscles of the hand using TheraBand, uh, plate carrying, and using the putty to squeeze. We, we also use uh, things like rope climbing as well to help strengthen up the, the hands and the wrists of the boxers. So as I said, unfortunately, um, occasionally we do have to go to surgery and, and ask one of our surgical colleagues to repair these. And I've done this because uh, it, I think it illustrates really well how the sagittal band tears. And it, this is on two knuckles, and this was done at the same time. So this was a uh, this is a boxer who was boxing in America uh, with lighter gloves. And the the opponent moved out of the way, and they they caught him with a glancing blow, which didn't do the opponent much harm, but actually did both these knuckles in. Uh, again, this this really needed repairing. There wasn't much we could do. The difficult the difficulty with these repairs is that it takes four to five months, and sometimes longer, to get them back to boxing again. It can take quite some time. Uh, this is the this is the repair, and again, this is a the, the we're trying to get the surgical scar between the knuckles because obviously they've got a punch on the knuckles, and we don't want them punching on the scar. So, prevention is always better than cure. So, as a as a final slide, uh, just look like to look at uh, how we prevent these injuries and this is in training because that's the where we've got most control so we only use larger gloves 14 ounce gloves for bags and pads 16 ounce gloves for sparring the heavier the glove the bigger it is the more padding there is in it strength and conditioning it's really important to maintain a neutral wrist position to prevent wrist injuries and so we work a lot on forearm strength and also shoulder strength and endurance allows a very strong platform for the punch to be thrown from. We've worked a lot on knuckle protection with good bandaging and using uh -huh. um, sophisticated foam padding. Uh, and we, we monitor the volume of training continuously uh, we, we use triax triaxial accelerometers in the wrists to measure the number of punches and the speed of the punches. And we look very carefully for overtraining and for, oh, and for, for accumulative fatigue in the patients, in the patients, in the boxes. Uh, and doing all those things, we, we monitor our injuries on a continual basis. And we've doing all those things, we've reduced our um knuckle injuries in training considerably and also by presenting further research to the international federation we have managed to get the the, the bandaging within competition uh, improved because we found that there was we had 800 times more knuckle injuries in competition which is a very small amount of time compared with training so we managed to get the international rules changed to allow more padding in the gloves in competition as well. So thank you very much for your time. And I'd like to thank, uh, special thanks to uh, Sophie Smith-Moore, who's the GB boxing physio, uh, who let me have uh, several of the slides tonight. So thank you very much to her. And then questions we'll do later. So thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mike. Um, apologies, Mike, and and and, and for delicacy and background that. noise uh, during Mike's presentation. I, I know Sue, um, our technical expert, has been working on it in the background. Um, uh, it to it <laughs> through the presentation, but it is back. Mike, can you Mike, mute yourself now? Um, I know all the delegates are muted. Um, um, so, thanks, Mike. 
Um, our, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Michael Elby. Uh, Mike uh, is a consultant at the Risk Surgeon and an NHS consultant at UCLH. Um, and Michael's talk this evening is on abdominal fractures and dislocations in athletes. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, I didn't you know it was possible to get cross wires on a, on a webinar. But... We seem to be able to. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Well, uh, we can't hear you, Michael, but um, the, the background noise is still there. Okay. You need to work on that in the background. Yeah, don't worry. Um, so I'm Michael Elvey, um, as I said, consultant and orthopedic surgeon, also based at UCH, uh, where I work with Alistair, um, and also here at the ISCH. Um, no, thanks for the invites. Thank you all for spending this uh, this warm evening with us. I'm sure you'd all like to be in the garden sipping some sangrias. Um, but if I can have your attention for 15, maybe 20 minutes, I'll keep it as okay. short as possible. Um, hopefully I can give you some useful information about finger fractures Ooh, and dislocations. Um, wh when I was asked to choose a topic oh, uh, within yeah. the hand and wrist, I just treated three athletes uh, with three finger fractures and I treated them in three very different ways. So I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to run through all the common finger fractures um, and how we managed them. I quickly got to a, a stage where we had about, uh, I had about 40 slides and I realized it was un unachievable. And then we had a call a couple of weeks ago and Alistair suggested running in dislocations as well. Uh, so I had a bit of an internal meltdown, we went to have a couple of glasses of whiskey got my thinking hat on and in the end decided that it'd be far more useful if we cover some of the sort of the higher level principles of how yeah. we manage these injuries. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do today. Um, we're going to focus on how I approach finger injuries specifically in athletes, focusing on the assessment, my decision making process, uh, planning return to play uh, and I'm not going to uh, cover specific injuries today. I'm very happy to do that at a later date if, if required. Um, so just start with a bit of basic anatomy. We have three phalanxes in the fingers, uh, proximal, middle and distal. Uh, at either end of each phalanx, we have the articular portions, the head and the base. And between them, we have the extra articular portions, which are the neck and the shaft. But with, with regards to the joint, I'm just going to focus on the PIP joint today, because this is the joint that gets most commonly injured um, in the finger in athletes and the one that causes us the most problems. Um, so the PIP joint is a, is a bicondylar hinge joint, like a knee. If you look here at the x-ray, the PIP joint head has uh, the PIP joint head has two condyles, um, unlike the MP head below, which has a single condyle. On its own, you can see that's fairly unstable. There's not much holding that joint in place. It's not like a ball and socket joint with innate stability. So it has a, a nice soft tissue envelope, and we describe a three-sided box around the joint. Uh, so we have strong collateral ligaments on each side and a bowler plate on the bowler aspect. And it's useful to note that for a dislocation to occur, at least two of those three structures one collateral and volar plate typically must be disrupted. And the joints and the digit itself is very well protected and enveloped within soft tissue. In fact, nowhere else in the body do we have such yeah. a complex arrangement of, of nerves, ligaments, tendons, muscles in, in quite uh, such close proximity. We saw that actually on, uh, on Mike's slide just before around the MP joint. And that has pros and cons. Uh, the pros are that they provide a stabilizing force and that's why so many finger fractures are stable they don't displace and we can move them quite quickly. Um, the con, unfortunately, is that when the body is injured, when the finger is injured, the body responds with an inflammatory response, which we all know, and that involves edema, which, which involves bathing these structures in a fibrous exudate, which causes everything to stick together. And unfortunately, that is why the fingers are so prone to going stiff and stiffness really is, is the enemy of the, of the hand surgeon and of course the athlete. So why am I talking about finger injuries? Finger injuries? Well, it's not just because I saw some on the day that I had to choose a topic. They are the number one fracture sustained by any athlete, typically with collisions with the ground, also with opponents, balls, other equipment. Fortunately, most finger fractures are very stable and they heal very quickly, and that's in part due to the soft tissue envelope we've just talked about. Um, but unfortunately, they can heal with malalignment, which can, put, which can prove quite functionally disabling. And when they involve joints, can heal with pain, stiffness, and, and later arthritis. So we do need to have a fairly low threshold to investigate them. The PIP joint is by far and away the least tolerant joint to injury. So injuries around the PIP joint need especially early, early um, attention in order to optimize rehabilitation. And a, a theme running through this is that treatment must be tailored to that individual. 
be it their sports, their, their stage of the season, the stage of their career, and even the opponents they're up against. So let's say I'm going to keep this high level. And when we approach any finger fracture or dislocation, we have some universal goals which apply to all. Preventing stiffness and maintaining alignment are at the top, and that's in order of importance. As I say, stiffness is the biggest, the biggest enemy to the hand surgeon. A stiff finger, one, is functionally severely disabling, but two, is predisposed to further injury down the line. Um, so I'll often accept a degree of malalignment, which may simply be cosmetic, in order to move the finger quickly. Stiffness. Our other uh, key goals, obviously, in, this, in the uh, athletic population, are to enable as yeah. early return to play as is safe and as is possible and obviously to minimize risk of complications. Uh, and a key point here is that appropriate early management will minimize the loss of their game time. Typically that's by preventing the formation of scar tissue that forms if people are just left to their own devices and strap up the finger. So on to clinical assessment, I'm not gonna teach you how to take a history. I want to know what happened, when it happened, how it happened, and often with athletes, there's, there's footage that you can go back to and have a look, which will help you predict the pattern of injury what's happened so far in their treatment and has there been an injury before we've all fallen into the traps of seeing a, a stiff or deformed finger thinking we'll get on and fix it when in fact it's been like that for years before i echo what alistair said in the first talk uh, the hand examination uh, is a uh, a look move feel not a look feel move so when we're looking we're looking for wounds open wounds carry a significant infection rate particularly when um, they are sustained outdoors and need copious irrigation but an open injury also implies a high level of injury with more periosteal stripping, higher risk of non-union, uh, and therefore needs to be watched very closely. When it comes to deformity, um, some of the common deformities we need to look for are dislocations, which should be reduced on scene, shortening rotation and angulation. Rotation is the one we need to be particularly concerned about as we don't have remodeling potential. Angulation can remodel to some extent, but rotation doesn't. And the best way to assess rotation is just to get both hands next to each other, as you can see in the top right, and ask them to form a fist. And we're looking for a loss of the cascade. You can see in this image that the patient's left hand, the image on the right, the index finger is rotating and is scissoring under the middle finger. Now, often patients can't do this in the acute setting. They don't have this range. So what we do then is, as you see on the image at the bottom, is look at what the nail is doing. So normally the nails form a nice smooth cascade. But a subtle sign of rotation is just noticing that the nail plate of the affected injury, uh, affected digit is slightly out of sync. Just a little sort of nugget. Um, when fingers are swollen, they will exaggerate their natural positions and the little finger naturally curves in towards the palm. It helps us cup the hand. Um, it also doesn't have bilateral support as the other lesser digits do. So when they swell, they often rotate inwards. Um, and I get a lot of referrals to me of, of rotational deformity of the little finger, which actually aren't, it's just the swelling. As that swelling comes down, uh, the finger looks, looks more normal. So once we've done our clinical assessment, we move, move on to investigations. And x-ray is the mainstay. I do use ultrasound, but x-ray is by far and away the mainstay. And this is, this is a sort of an oldie, uh, but I think it's still constantly relevant. Whenever you see an x-ray, never accept a single view. Um, what you see in a single view can look fairly benign and reassuring, whereas we get the contralateral view or the 90 degree orthogonal view and it looks a little bit more disturbing. And when it comes to the finger, we actually need three. So that's, that's a bit, I know that I can see that's projecting a bit blurred. The reason we need three is when you have a side view of the finger, we can't separate the two condyles that, that I mentioned before. So we need some slight obliquity in that image so we can view those condyles clearly. So uh, you, you know us as orthopedic surgeons, there's really two things you need to know about us. We're very confident. We think we're the best of what we do and often the best of what other people do. Um, but at the same time, we're not academics um, and we like to keep things really simple. And when I have my trainees with me, two questions I tell them to ask of any injury in front of them. Look at the hand, look at the x-ray. If it heals in that position, will it be OK? So is the fracture well aligned? Is the joint well reduced? If it's not, we, need, we immediately need to do something about it. If it is, the key is to try and work out, will it stay in that position? And that really brings us to the mainstay of decision making, which is all about stability. What do I mean by that? Well, a stable joint is a joint that will stay in place through range of motion and a stable fracture is a fracture that won't displace through normal motion. And we use that stability or that assessment of stability to stratify our patients. We have stable fractures, which can be moved quickly and rehab quickly. We have unstable fractures where we often need to intervene to do something about them. Where it becomes a bit more complicated is that stability is a dynamic phenomenon. As, as time elapses post-injury, because of that fibrous exudate, which can cause stiffness, things do get stickier. Uh, and therefore, we have this third category, the at-risk fracture or the at-risk dislocation, 
which at that moment in time may seem unstable, but you know that with some temporary mobilization, it will get sticky and we'll be able to move it. Um, and then the consideration then becomes, where is that? What is going on in that athlete's career? How soon do they need to return to sport? Have I got two, three weeks to play with splinting before I start rehabilitating? Uh, so that's how I stratify my patients and that's how I'll base my plan, be it operative or non-operative. And a point to make here, and I'm gonna make it again, all of our treatment strategies involve some degree of compromise between stability and soft tissue insult. One quick slide. The study that you can see on the left here is generally okay for pretty much all finger injuries on field. I've just put up a dorsal dislocation on the right because this is the most common dislocation that you'll see. Um, and what we have here is a type one and type two, which is very clear to see on x-ray, but not clear to see uh, in 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 uh, real life when, when you're on clinical assessment. And why is it relevant? Well, a simple type one dislocation on the top, you just pull gently on the finger. You don't often need anesthetic. It will reduce very simply. On the bottom, the type two is where you can see this bayonet apposition. One finger is, one phalanx is completely over the top of the other. What you're not appreciating here is the noose that has formed around the head of that proximal phalanx. Those collateral ligaments and that FDS have tightened the noose around the head. And actually, if you pull hard on the finger, you just tighten that noose and it won't reduce. And the way you need to reduce that is by hyperextending the finger and pushing it, thumbing it over the top. And as you don't know, when you're looking clinically, which one it is, I would advise you use that for all your, all your dislocations. And it can be done on field with or without ring block, depending on who, you, who you're treating. We'll get into more definitive management. I completely agree with, um, with Mike Lucemore's comment. Non-operative management is the preferred management of all hand and wrist injuries. So I'll tend to go to non-operative management whenever I can. So for all my stable fractures and dislocations, or my at-risk ones, the ones that I know I can splint for a short period of time and then start moving. Now, if I think I have to splint for anything more than three weeks, I might revise that opinion. As when you get to that sort of stage, you'll start to induce stiffness. It's going to be hard to work out. And I'll just run through some of the more common splints that, that we use. Um, the neighbour strapping you'll all be familiar with is by far and away the most common strapping I use. This is not immobilisation, it is stabilisation. I'll use it for minimally displaced and stable finger fractures, simple dislocations. Um, very, very effective. The dorsal blocking splint, which you can see here, is one that protects three sides of the finger and allows early movement. So in this case, a dorsal block it will allow early flexion. Um, I typically use those for my volar plate avulsions, my large volar plate avulsions. The, the small ones, a buddy strap will be okay. I use it for my dorsal dislocations that are stable and I can move them quickly. And I actually use them for a lot of my fractures, a lot of uh, um, stable phalangeal fractures, shaft fractures in particular. The posi the position of safe immobilization splint can be used for absolutely anything. It's there just to know about. If you're not sure what to do, that's a safe position to put the hand and wrist as it won't form a contracture within a few weeks. Um, but it's not something I typically use for finger injuries in my practice. And then just two final splints, um, which are injury specific, but the two most common I use. So the first is a PIPJ extension splint. This one is a dynamic version, but they can be static. These are fantastic for central slip injuries. This is the one exception to the rule where I'll splint a joint for more than three weeks. I will splint them for up to six weeks with a central slip. But what it does, it immobilizes the PIP joint. It allows the MP joint and the DIP joint to move normally, which allows the, the, the lateral bands, the conjoined lateral bands, uh, to assume a more anatomical position um, and prevent stiffness. And finally, the mallet or thimble splint, which can be used for anything, DIPJ or distal, so puff fractures, D, uh, P3 shaft fractures, nail bed injuries, mallet injuries. Very versatile splint. Um, but of course, there are circumstances where we do need to operate. Um, in the classic indications of fingers will be our open wounds, the unstable fractures and dislocations, all those when they're at risk and we simply need to get them back that bit quicker. So here's a few examples along the bottom. Of course, this is not exhaustive. Um, on the left, to going left to right, the open dislocation. Now, there is some evidence that you can treat open dislocations with on-field washouts and closures. I still feel more comfortable doing a formal theatre washout. Um, going across one, we have a transverse displaced vet fracture. When we have transverse fractures, there's very little bone to interdigitate. There's not a lot of intrinsic stability in those fractures. So often those do need operative management. Then we get onto a joint injury. This is a classic condylar injury, a shear injury. And you can see how that fracture just wants to fall down that slope. And that's exactly what they do. They progressively displace. So this is a fracture that I'll typically manage operatively. And then we've got some of the real nasties, the pilon type fracture here, where the, 
where the um, proximal phalanx has, has driven itself into um, the uh, base of the, uh, the, the middle phalanx and it's just split it in, in half. And here a complex fracture dislocation where there's a, a chunk of bone off that's gonna render that joint unstable. Here's a, uh, the smorgasbord, I should say, of the operations that I do. And I do all of these operations, but they've all got pros and cons. It comes back to that, that line I said before that any procedure, any treatment, but certainly any operation is a balance between the stability you into it and the soft tissue damage that you cause. Um, so it, but I will briefly talk about these moving from left to right again. On the left, you see the classic percutaneous KY fixation when you do a closed reduction, when you pull the finger into the right position and you poke some wires through the skin. This is simple, it's quick, it's very cheap, um, but there are some issues with it. It's not that stable. You wouldn't be able to let your physio, your therapist crack on with full range of motion straight away. We do have wires poking through the skin, which are posing infection risk. Um, and whilst the soft tissue damage is minimal in that we don't make an incision, inevitably you tether one of those structures that Mike's just shown you in, in, in his talk, uh, and therefore you won't be able to get full range of motion uh, even once pain allows and you've got a bit of stability in there. So I typically reserve these for sort of my elderly no demand patients or children who don't go stiff. So the next level up is putting the KYs inside the bone beneath the skin. So this is an intramedullary fixation of a fracture. This was, this was a metacarpal neck fracture which is actually healed. And what you do here is you make a small incision at the base of the bone, which is away from the injury, which helps, reduces that risk of stiffness, make a hole in the bone and poke the wires inside to provide some internal stability. So our infection rate is lower here because the wires aren't, uh, aren't exposed. Um, we get reasonable internal fixation, so we can begin range of motion normally within a couple of weeks, not immediately, they're not that stable. But there are problems with this as well. Um, so the wires can cause irritation and they do need to come out at a later date, which is a second operation. Uh, number three here is, is, the, is a dynamic external fixator, a Suzuki frame. And what we've done here is we've got wires above and below uh, a, a significantly damaged joints. And what we're effectively doing is constantly pulling on the finger, but allowing a little bit of range of motion. That's all they do. So these are for devastating joint injuries. I probably do four or five of these a year. Um, in theory, you can begin moving quickly, but the, the motion you get from these early is, is fairly limited. Um, and, and, and you're in trouble, really, if an athlete who needs their finger has got this sort of injury. You've got to be very guarded in your prognosis. The, the next two images are what I think is most relevant to athletes. These are the ones that I, I perform most in athletes. So these are the two, two that I performed in the operative treatment a few weeks ago. So this is what we would call percutaneous fixation. We make tiny holes in the skin where required. We manually reduce the joint outside and we put rigid fixation screws across um, and then normally a stitch or two at the end. And what that does is provide immediate stability with, I think, a good compromise of soft tissue damage, so not significant soft tissue damage. We get them moving within days rather than weeks. And we've got examples here of cortical fixation with the two screws, and then the slide across intramedullary fixation. Okay, a small wire is put up the finger through a stab incision in the skin, and we put a screw over the top of it, and the, these fractures can be moved instantly. They heal very well. And finally, we've got plate and screw fixation, which I'm sure you've all seen. I think as surgeons, we all go through the same sort of rite of passage. And as we get more, more comfortable and more confident in our abilities, we realize we can plate and screw everything. And we do, and we get fantastic x-rays. Unfortunately, it doesn't take long to realize um, that the outcomes of these are often pretty poor. Even with the best surgical technique, you're looking at significant stiffness. And if you look at sort of meta-analyses on, on plate fixations and phalanxes, 90% of patients will not regain full range of motion. So really, of course, there are indications. If I have to stabilize a finger uh, and the other options, the percutaneous options just aren't good enough. There's just too many pieces. This is what's left. But again, very, very cautious uh, prognosis. Fix them well. Get your therapist involved immediately. You have to move these pretty much you know, day one to get to, to stop everything sticking down. Um, but they still do have a role. Last two slides. Um, rehabilitation. So whether it's operative or non-operative management, you have to tailor your rehabilitation to your patients, obviously, and it must be led. It must be must be effectively planned in a multidisciplinary scenario. So that should involve the surgeon, of course, the team clinicians and physios, as well as the hand therapists. You will often have often have some extra expertise to offer extra kit, extra splints to offer. Um, the trick really is to mobilise as early as possible. The outcome of surgery um, is certainly not determined by the surgery itself. Um, Surgery simply imparts a little bit more stability. And, and for me, it is all about early mobilization. And the way I approach all my finger fractures is what is the least I can do to safely move this quickly? And that generally 
stands you in good stead. Finally, return to sport. There are no real consensus guidelines here. I, I do look them up regularly to make sure I'm not doing something that, that nobody else is. You have to consider numerous factors for the injury pattern, how you've treated it, the sport they're playing and the position they play, the legality of splinting. Don't, don't put a splint on that's, that needs to be on there for three weeks, ask them to play when, when actually you know, if they fall foul of their local rules. And again, the stage of the season in career. So this, these are some indicative, this is my practice, by the way, so, so, so please don't quote this, but just some indicative numbers of, of the sort of return to injury. You can take a snap of this, or I think that the, the, the pictures, are, the slides are going up on the website. Um, I would stress that this is a sort of return to play for people who require those, those digits in, their, in, the main for, in, in the main part of their play. But, you know, if I have a sprinter who comes to me with a phalanx fracture, he, he can sprint home for all I care, doesn't, it's not going to interfere with their, with their function. But these sort of indicative numbers that I give and you see the sort of long ones are those central slip injuries that need that little bit more splinting and protection and the very unstable phalanx base fractures. So in conclusion, finger injuries are exceptionally common. They're very easily overlooked. We've all heard it's just a finger, it will get better. Um, but we know that if, by appropriately managing them early and investigating early, we can get them back quicker by preventing that scar tissue forming, getting them moving at the right time with the right support. But beware of overtreating them. Stiffness is always the enemy, far more than malalignment, and I will always accept a degree of cosmetic deformity over a potentially stiff finger. Thank you very much. Those are my personal details, by the way. Obviously, everyone on, on here is very welcome to take them. Please don't pass them on to, to patients. <clears throat> Super. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Another really clear presentation. Thank you to all three uh, uh, presenters tonight. Um, uh, questions, please uh, put into the uh, chat box. Um, there's a couple that uh, we can start with um, uh, in, 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 the, in the minutes that we have left. Um, first, uh, the question came through, uh, which I think uh, directed to Alistair, but I think each of the presenters may have comment on this because I think each of you mentioned it. It's the use of ultrasound uh, in diagnostics. Are the particular uh, hand injuries that you think ultrasound is most effective, more effective in? Um, uh, and then and sort of the, the, the pros of ultrasounds in, in the management and the diagnostics of some injuries. Uh, Alistair, maybe we start with you. Um, yes, I'm, I'm happy to say this on, and then maybe uh, Mike and Mike can give their thoughts too. It would be good to hear them. Um, I think ultrasound does have a role in investigation. MRI scan gives us a very global picture uh, and can help when really we're not too clear on the differential diagnosis. Ultrasound, I find, is very good for tendon problems. Um, certainly, it depends on the skill and understanding of your sonographer, and I think you have to be clear whether you rely on them and whether they're used to um, scanning the hand routinely. Um, but certainly, things like ECU tendinopathy, um, things like ECU instability, it's a dynamic scan, so it's really helpful. So many of these pathologies are only evident when we move the wrist or move the fingers. So. It can be really helpful to understand if there's instability in the ECU uh, on, on movement or certain postures. Um, again, yeah, flexor tendon injuries or extensor tendon injuries, sometimes that can be helpful. Um, and then any evidence of joint synovitis, I think that's usually quite a good way of identifying inflammation within joints. So that, those are my sort of go-to differential diagnoses and, and, and use of ultrasound. I think the key points I would bring across are know your sonographer, um, form a relationship with them, uh, uh, and that makes a big, big difference in terms of how much you trust the information you're gaining. Uh, thank you, Alistair. Um, Mike Lusmore. Uh, Mike, any comments on ultrasound? Uh, you did mention in the talk the, the, uh, the use that it has. Yeah. I no, I agree with Alistair. It's a, uh, it, it's a very, it can be extremely useful diagnostic tool. Uh, there's no ionizing radiation. It's dynamic, uh, good for ligaments, good for tendons, but it's very much operator dependent. And if you have a, a an ultrasonographer that you trust and that, you know, gives you accurate results, then you, you use them. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great tool and it's a good tool to have in the clinic as well, just to, to look at things. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, um, Michael Elvey, any uh, additional comments on ultrasound? I think you did mention it in your talk very briefly. 
Yeah, no, no, I, so I, I use ultrasound a lot. It's almost 50-50, I'd say, uh, as Mike Lucemore just said, uh, ligaments, particular skiers, thumb type injuries, uh, anything where there's a dynamic component, I find it's useful for sagittal plans, ECU, subluxation. Um, and obviously it's got the added benefit that you can sometimes treat and inject this at the same time. Um, so yeah, I, I use it a lot. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, just on injection therapy, there, um, a, a corticosteroid injection mentioned uh, a, a few times on, on tendons and, uh, and joints. Uh, the role of, of ostomil in, um, or, or equivalent in, uh, in hand tendons, uh, is that something that any of you use? I, I don't personally. I'm not aware of any convincing evidence. Um, I do use steroid injections. Um, I, think, I think we often don't know why they work for certain conditions. But they certainly do. So I use them both diagnostically and therapeutically quite a lot. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike or Alistair, any uh, comments on that? Uh, I would say uh, similar. I, I don't use Ostinil uh, routinely. Um, it's certainly in the hand and wrist, there isn't much written about it. Maybe there's an opportunity to look at that in more detail uh, with studies. But um, yeah, corticosteroid is, is my go to for that kind of uh, pathology. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, injecting into the hand and wrist, I think it can be quite painful. Uh, and I think uh, I always warn patients that it's going to be sore for at least uh, two or three days. They can otherwise get quite a surprise, particularly intra-articular injections in the hand. Um, it can be difficult. So a, a top tip there is just to give them a warning about that. Uh, thank you. Sorry, Mike. It no, I, 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 sorry, I haven't got much to add, really. I, I don't use Austin uh, in the, the hand and wrist. Thanks, Mike. Um, another question um, to Michael LV, um, a really useful practical tip on uh, on-field uh, reduction. Um, I think that was re really, really useful and, uh, and something that, that many um, listeners can, can apply. He talks through a little bit just about that, that, that noose uh, in, impingement and any other um, uh, tips for on-field uh, reduction, anything else that people should be thinking about? Um, yeah, yeah, probably easier with a, a slide up with, with the right anatomy, but effectively we, we have collateral ligaments that go from the, the dorsal lateral aspects of the proximal phalanx down to the volar uh, or palmar lateral aspects of the P2. And when that P2 is pulled over the top, it effectively strangles the head. Those collateral ligaments strangle the head. Um, also, just at that level, the FDS normally starts to separate. And as you can imagine, you pull the, the middle phalanx up, that noose, that gap in the two can just flip around again, flip around the proximal phalangeal head. Um, and if you pull, all you're doing is tighten the noose. You're fighting against yourself, basically. You're tightening structures that are, are fighting. You can also pull the volar plate into the joint as well. Um, as I say, that the, the, the point I just made was it, it's it's impossible clinically to tell really what, what which one it is. Um, so the simpler way is just just bend it back. Even, it looks ridiculous, but bend it back even more. Really hyperextend the joint, and then just push it back rather than pulling it back over the top. Um, I think in the hand, that's probably the most common dislocation you'll see. I mean, the same theory can apply at the um, at the metacarpophalangeal joint. I would use exactly the same technique. Um, and I, I, I don't tend to see too many DIPJ dislocations. Um, we don't have the same structures as the DIPJ. We don't have volar plates. Um, so, so slight, and we don't have tendon, a tendon crossing that, the, that, that bifurcates in the same way. The FDP is just a single slip. So I think that's why it doesn't happen quite so often. Uh, super, thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, that, uh, that concludes our, our evening. Uh, no further questions. Um, Thank you to each of the speakers. Uh, really clear presentations this evening uh, and lots of really interesting information. Uh, thank you. See you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you.